Hi, everyone. I'm Gordon Happ, technology evangelist for Red Hat. And I'm here today with Richard to talk about automation. Richard, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Gordon. So my name is Richard Henshaw. I'm the senior manager for product management for the Ansible automation platform at Red Hat. Uh, I've been with Red Hat for nearly four years now. And before that, I spent about 15 years working in financial services IT. So Richard, if a customer or prospect wants to talk with you about automation, what problems are they typically having that they think you can help with? I mean, this is a, I mean, the, the one nice thing about this is that typically it's a very broad set of problems. It's never the same problem over and over again. But even regardless of how mature people's sort of, uh, you know, how mature people are with automation so far, it tends to vary around two things. Um, one is what can I automate, right? And two is where should I, what, you know, how should I start automating that thing? And I think that's a, it's a very promising concept in, in automation itself because it means people looking for the things to do, looking for the problems to try and solve, what they can try and fix. But at the same time, they're also, you know, trying to figure out what they should do, right? So I think there's both a desire to do something, but also a desire to like do something that everybody else is doing because typically we always think we're doing something unique and special, but actually we, we have a, a fairly common set of problems that we're trying to sort of fix and address. So let's say people in organizations have bought into automation in principle. What might get in the way of success? What challenges and inhibitors are they likely to encounter? So I always think of this as the, the first the first big challenge for for automation, I always think is trust. Right. And I don't mean that is in the sense of do I trust the people I work with? Do I trust who I sit and communicate with every day? It's always with automation is do we trust what we're doing? Right. There's always going to be somebody who will say, Hey, but what happens if it goes wrong? What happened? How do I know what's what's being done, who's doing it, where it's happening? And so trust is a is a is often the I think the most common thing that people misunderstand. They always think of automation as being a technical thing. I mean, automation is heavily technical, but the 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 people element, the you know, understanding different groups and what their objectives are and what they want to try and get and what they're concerned about and what worries them, these are things that people often miss when it comes to automation. And establishing that trust in what you're doing. Is I think one of the is one of the most common and most important problems to try and address. I think we saw this with CI/CD systems when they were really starting to get popular. That for a lot of people, yeah, the, the automated testing was fine, but we want a human to give it the good old K before it goes into production. Yeah, and I think that whole um, I have a colleague who talks about this as one of his things that his background is like the software automation phase. Right. And for years, there was massive investment in how do I improve the quality of software automation, the testing, the validation. And that has just been stretched further and further down in, through the IT landscape into all sorts of different spaces. But how do you how do you apply that same rigor that you've, you've been quite happily applying in one place to the entirety of what's possible? As I've watched this space over time, I've been uh, struck how over really a pretty short period of time, we've shifted quite hard from talking about things like standard operating environments and configuration management to a broader automate all the things story. What happened? Well, I think, you know, IT went through the same sort of transformation that most industries have been through. And I always, um, I think back to, you know, manufacturing confectionery or building cars or you know household appliances all of these industries went through this transformation where they moved from being bespoke individually crafted um, items to being more heavily produced so we have to do more and more of them and I think you know especially in the last say 10 10 maybe to 15 years that transition of how you know as IT has become more and more important as, as computers have become more important to everything that we do as we become more connected it's changed what our expectation is around how something should be delivered. And as soon as one area or one group makes something better, the next group wants something to be better as well. You know, it's back to that same parallel with the software automation. You know, it's the how do I now 
keep eking out those efficiencies, gain gain more advantage or benefit from what I'm doing. Although the pets versus cattle analogy has probably thankfully fallen out of favor, we've also seen this shift from configuration management tools that keep that pet instance running and you know, look at configuration drift and things like that, and have really moved to this much more mass immutable infrastructure type of model. Yeah, I, th- I think this is where things like cloud sort of come in and start to, obviously you have to talk about cloud if you want to talk about IT transformation and automation in the current scene. But taking away from that, I have got this one specially crafted, curated, well, you know, people used to look after servers like they looked after an old car, right? You know, they would be well-maintained and well-looked after. And as, you know, the commoditization happened of, of IT infrastructure and that suddenly changed and you suddenly realize, actually, I can just take that one out, get rid of it, throw it away, put another one in. That changes the way you have to interact and behave with the device. You know, you can't just always expect that same level of, of care and attention. And you want to get the thing back up and running quickly, efficiently, um, and with, you know, as repeatable a process as possible. This ubiquitous automation that we've been talking about dovetails with a bunch of other trends. For example, when we talked about security and DevSecOps in another video in this series, it was quite obvious that you can't do security really without automated testing and consistent configurations. Let's tie into another topic, cloud, specifically hybrid cloud. Can you draw the line between how hybrid clouds fit with automation? I don't, I don't think you can really talk about cloud without talking about automation. I think you know the two are so heavily connected. I think you know if you want to be really cynical on one side, you can say, hey, cloud is just managed data centers, man, you know, outsourcing the, the hardware and provisioning. But how has cloud been successful in that model when managed outsource existed before? That's because you tie those two things together. How do you take the infrastructure and get all the way to the software, the application deployment? Good automation, consistent, uh, consistent automation you're trying to deliver that delivers a consistent service that everybody can access in an easy to follow way. And having that sort of, that ability added in to what is the delivery of at mass scale has been really what's facilitated that trend. And then when you add that back to how does it tie into hybrid, you know, how do you get the same experience that a cloud provider offers or that a cloud service can give you with your own on-premise infrastructure? Well, automation, again, is the key. Yes, there will be technologies that will help, but having a good automation position, a good automation structure around what you're trying to deliver to focus on that service deliverable, that's where the two things sort of join. And so I think you can't separate automation from cloud, um, but obviously cloud is more than just automation, right? And I think that's where I'd sort of position it. So edge and your nerve things in an industrial setting is another area where scale just overwhelms manual processes. You know, imagine a thousand devices in an oil refinery, for example. What's needed to make automation work at that kind of scale? I mean, it, it's a nice logical extension from the cloud circumstance as well. You know, if you think back 10 years, cloud was a very open definition for what it is. And Edge has a very similar position at the moment. You ask 10 people what Edge is, you'll get 11 different answers as to what they think it is. But, you know, having a capability that is available in multiple locations is going to become important for Edge because we can't keep adding new patterns and shifts in the way that we do technology and then keep adding new capabilities to manage them. There needs to be consistency. That's why we're starting to see things like Kubernetes, which obviously, you know, automates heavily what is possible to deploy and build for hosting those applications distributed wider out to the Edge. That's why some of the things we're doing with our automation tools also do the same thing. How do we help provide consistency of tooling and capability across those locations so that the people using, um, you know, deploying applications, using those uh, devices and uh, connected machines in those places can, can make what they need to make happen and not be dependent on trying to figure out also how to deploy it, how to manage it, how to configure it. So an organization automates all the things. Who's involved and what benefits should they expect to see at the end of the day? So as to who should be involved, I think the easy way to answer this one is 
anybody who wants to be or needs to be involved should be involved in automation. Um, I often see a, a common sort of mistake when people first start on automation journeys and they think, well, who, who's going to benefit from the automation? And they often think, in short, I always think of, you know, people think automation is a selfish act. It's something I do for me to make my job easier. But the real power of automation comes when you actually extend it and offer, start offering it as a service out to others. I think why the clouds have been so successful in what they're able to offer, offer the service, offer it well. And so as you start to have that sort of move from the individual out to teams to the organization, that's who starts to have to be involved. Something somewhere extra can always be automated at a next step. doesn't mean you should automate every single thing when you begin, but as, you, as it becomes effective, cost-effective, and starts to become beneficial to do so, you start to target them. And then that's where you start to see the benefits. So, you know, are you looking to reduce your costs, like the overall sprawl of what you end up managing because, you know, you haven't got inefficient, you haven't got efficient deployments. Improve the efficiency of the time to deliver, to be able to react and respond to certain things, to be able to provide capabilities quicker. Or you're looking to reduce risks and reduce, um, you know, costly mistakes that often get made because, you know, people just make mistakes sometimes. But you want to say, you don't want to remove the people, you just want to remove the mistakes from being made because there's always more work to try and, you know, to try and achieve, you know, outcomes and objectives you've got. Well, thank you, Richard. Okay, thanks very much.